Um, and uh, we are now recording, so I will get started. Um, and it'll be good practice to see if, um, you know, I'm trying some new approaches and so forth. So um, we'll begin with prayer. Gracious and merciful God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity to read and delve more deeply into the scriptures for our worship this Sunday. Send down your Holy Spirit that we may uh, see what you uh, have to reveal to us. Give us open minds, open ears, open hearts. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I'm going to start with um, uh, just, uh, well, before we read the, the passage, I will give you a heads up with this, of course, is not the beginning of the chapter. This, this book is the last uh, chapter uh, in the book of Proverbs, okay? But we are not starting at the beginning. We're missing... Um, the the verses that say you know that these are the words um that uh someone who is training up a new king you know basically um uh, like a child and it's called an oracle it says an oracle that his mother taught him um and he's sort of rem rem reminiscing of what his mother taught him and just uh, to, so you'll know how this, con this one theme continues on. It ends with uh, this new ruler being told, speak out for those who cannot speak, for the rights of all the destitute, speak out, judge righteously, defend the rights of the poor and needy. Um, so uh, what I'm going to do is start um, with the verse 10. Um, this is um, another one of those acrostics, meaning it's a poem in which the first letter uh, starting every sentence begins with the uh, corresponding uh, letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Uh, so you can sort of see this is like the ABCs of uh, a good wife, you might say. Um, but it goes beyond that. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read this, the passage, and I want you to listen for any word or phrase that jumps out at you. Okay. A capable wife who can find. She is far more precious than jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her, and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not harm all the days of her life. She seeks wool and flax and works with willing hands. She is like the ships of the merchant. She brings her food from far away. She rises while it is still night and provides food for her household and task for her servant girls. She considers a field and buys it. With the fruit of her hands, she plants a vineyard. She girds herself with strength and makes her arms strong. She perceives that her merchandise is profitable. Her lamp does not go out at night. She puts her hands to the distaff and her hands hold the spindle. She opens her hand to the poor and reaches out her hands to the needy. She is not afraid for her household when it snows, for all her household are clothed in crimson. She makes herself coverings. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is known in the city gates, taking his seat among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them. She supplies the merchant with sashes. Strength and dignity are her clothing, and she laughs at the time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom, 
and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her happy. Her husband too, and he praises her. Many women have done excellently, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her a share in the fruit of her hands and let her works praise her in the city gates. Okay. Anything catch your attention? The perfect woman. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> point of view. Yeah. There are some things about this that are very traditional views of women and some things that are not. Yeah. She's going to buy a vineyard and she's going to use some business acumen mm -hmm. to make a profit. That's not what we think of as a traditional woman. Mm -hmm. um, Equity, certainly. It, it, she's, she, she does, she's, it's an, um, I can bring home the bacon and cook it up in a pan kind of woman. Of that song. <laughs> uh, and, you know, there's always forever has been a lot of emphasis on beauty and sweetness and charm and it, but after all of that it says charm and beauty will only get you so far you need a woman of substance mm -hmm. so it's kind of a mixed message in this when when i read it i, I took some mixed signals there yeah speaking of the the uh the part about uh, you know, the physical attractiveness. Um, I, I just read an article um, that uh, now Seventeen magazine, um, which I didn't know, I, it was around when I was you know a young person. I guess it still is, and uh, they got lots of letters from girls challenging them to uh, use photos that weren't photoshopped. Mm -hmm. And um, so now they do. And then if they want to see, um, they do an issue, uh, you know, in their issue, they include pictures that are not photoshopped. They also, in the pictures that they have, you can look online and it will show you what, it, what this person looked like with, before the Photoshop. Um, and I thought that was, uh, uh, well, shows a sign of progress, but also uh, indicates that uh, they're recognizing that girls have been damaged by these kinds of expectations. I have noticed too, like on commercials in particular, there's one where there's a woman in a jogging outfit. I forget what she's advertising. It's a black woman, mm -hmm. young and attractive, but she is not skinny. Mm -hmm. She's in fact a little, little bit chunky, more like a normal woman. And I have noticed some other trends mm -hmm. where we're showing women that have a little bit of meat on their bones. Uh, in and some of them are maybe even could be seen as medically a little overweight. And it's a lot more realistic view of what women really look like. And I've commented on it to John a couple of times. So I, I Change comes slowly. Yeah, sure does. Um, the, you were talking about, um, you know, some of the uh, mixed messages that uh, might have come from this. Um, and I'll go over some of the uh, things that I have uh, of come at about um, historically this been uh, this passage has been used to uh, perpetuate you know culturally specific gender roles mm -hmm. and it's always you know, not always it's frequently read you know on Mother's Day and uh, which I think kind of uh, trivializes it um, it's it's um, it's perpetu perpetuated a certain idea of femininity mm -hmm. uh, that uh, it isn't really uh, egalitarian. Uh, 
Um, another thing, it uses this, it, I mean, it makes me tired just hearing about this and this imagery of hard work um, kind of also perpetuates um, impossible standards of, you know, labor. Um, and to, to say that success is always based on uh, hard work and it's, and uh, so the inverse of that would be that poverty or lack of success is the result of an individual or a, a moral failure mm -hmm. of the person. And uh, you know, we live in a world uh, where you know ambition is you know uh, promoted, and uh, and if you don't have ambition, you know you're you're some kind of slacker. Um, and uh, and that you're judged by how much money you make. Um, which obviously here is not your typical household because she's obviously from a wealthier household than your average citizen at that time. With all of the things she's making garments out of and they all look nice and they're- The purple cloth. Oh yeah, she has servants. But, oh yeah, I mean, she buys land. Um, uh, you know, she, she's obviously living a very uh, privileged lifestyle. If, uh, this is a picture of what a capable wife uh, does. Um, of course, you know, the, the problem is that when our ambitions are just about money, they're essentially selfish ambitions. Um, and, uh, you know, Ultimate that in our system, you know, our economic system, you know, that's what basically how people are judged. Uh, and, uh, you know, she's a, another example of, uh, you know, the rich getting richer. You know. And of course, you know, James, when we get to the epistle, James was very concerned about this. And, uh, um, you know, he talks about selfish ambition. Um, and he said, whenever people are jealous or selfish, they cause trouble and do all sorts of cruel things. Um, so, um, you know, we tend to see the meaning of life as uh, about success, where if you read carefully in Proverbs, even though it talks about prospering, prospering doesn't necessarily mean um, Filthy rich. You know, for, for Proverbs, it's walking, you know, in the way of God. You know? um, so it's not as different, you know, from what James is saying as one might think. Um, and of course, you know, Jesus was always talking about walking uh, that different path. Um, and, you know, we, when we look at this, you know, we have to recognize the difference in uh, modern culture and the culture of that time. Um, it is obviously a patriarchal society. Um, I mean, look, she's doing all this work and what's the guy do, her husband doing? You know, he's sitting around chewing fat, you know, with the other privileged uh, men making big decisions for the whole community. Uh, and all of her work enables him to have that privilege. I thought of the phrase too, behind every successful man is a woman. I thought mm -hmm. of that when I came to the end and how he's, you know, he's got a good reputation in the community, mm -hmm. fostered in part by her mm -hmm. and what she's doing in the background. Yeah, I, uh, I was struck this morning, I, I watch, um, parts of, while I'm still at home, um, Morning Joe. And they have a segment there, uh, something like Fabulous 50 over uh, 50. And it's about um, successful women, you know, who are, again, over 50. Um, of course, if you're really successful, you know, it usually isn't when you're 30, you know, it usually happens, happens later. But they're highlighting it, 
this is a regular series, they highlight all these incredible accomplishments, business accomplishments and uh, so forth of, of women, um, you know, medical breakthroughs and, and so forth. Um, and to look at it, these women, and many of them are black women also. There was, a, this morning, there was a woman who was from Bangladesh, you know, who's now a big business tycoon, who also gives back in, to the community in terms of providing business loans for women to, you know, start up businesses. You think about it, all these hundreds and hundreds of years, women have not been able to do those things, but they didn't just suddenly become capable, you know, they were capable all along, uh, but were not allowed to be. Um, and particularly, you know, when you think about today, uh, the, the tragedy of Afghanistan is that for 20 years, women were starting to make that step yeah. that maybe in the U.S. began, you know, in the much earlier, uh, you know, even with uh, women being allowed into, you know, into schools, you know, women didn't allow, colleges didn't allow women in, most colleges most colleges. There were some for women, um, but most did not allow women until, you know, a little over a hundred years ago mm -hmm. or, or even later. I mean, in my own home state, uh, you know, Virginia, uh, women could not uh, attend the University of Virginia until 1972. Really? So, you know, this kind of holding women back has been going on. Um, not only for a long time, but until fairly until fairly recently in our history. Um, so obviously, this this woman uh, you know shows that she can um, be a valuable member of society and accomplishment as well as her um, her uh, you know as well as her husband. Um, The other um, thing is that we can look at or need to notice that Proverbs began, you know, the first 10 chapters uh, talk about lady wisdom. Some of these phrases in this last chapter about this capable wife mirror the ones of lady wisdom. So it's almost as if you know, this is uh, Lady Wisdom, the ideal, the power, and then now she's at home <laughs> and uh, living it in a ordinary daily life. Yeah. Um, um, She, um, her, her uh, we also should think about that this is not in light of all of Proverbs. It isn't just a model for a woman. It's a model for all people, but also uh, perhaps uh, an unattainable model, you know. Um, so she's sort of the, the real to the Lady Wisdom's unreal, you know, ideal. Um, so it, uh, you know, from the beginning, the, the poem um, though does define virtue and we'll talk about virtue in the other readings, um, but having an active engagement in the world, you know. So, uh, you know, it's a, a community pers perspective of what can you do for your community, you know, not just for yourself. Um, so, um, yeah, they mentioned that she works in the community helping mm -hmm. the poor, which would mm -hmm. be ideal. It's an ideal person. Yeah. And the phrase, you know, the, the woman uh, talking about her arms and her hands and getting strong, it also 
sort of highlights the value of manual labor, which we tend to uh, put down in this country. You know, if you're a manual laborer, you know, it's set in the economics that you don't make as much as someone who doesn't, you know, do manual labor, you know. Um, so I remember uh, my grandmother was just uh, another era when my uh, mother uh, grew up in the, oh, in the 40s uh, that uh, she was insistent that they always wear a hat when they go outside and you know, cover themselves up because uh, having a tan meant you were a manual laborer. You were out in the fields, you know? And so it was... Uh, uh, I have read, and I don't know if this is true, it may not be true. The term redneck mm -hmm. comes from when the Irish immigrated and they were working their fields all the time and did manual work when they came here. And the backs of their necks were red with sunburn. Mm -hmm. And so that was the term you used for somebody who wasn't quite that high up in the social hierarchy. I don't know if that's correct or not. I'm just throwing that out. It certainly makes sense. You know, I you know. Now we view tans as being, you know, you're wealthy enough to be able that's to take sure. Winter time. <laughs> yeah, symbol of leisure. Yeah. And that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, it's good that you have enough leisure to be able to afford to tan because you've got mm -hmm. money. Yeah. All righty. Um, I'm going to go on to the, to the psalm. Uh, you know, we've looked at this psalm before. Uh, because there are only certain, well, the, of course, there are only 150 psalms, and not all of them are in the lectionary. So we do have repeats during the year in our worship service. Um, and so, therefore, we, you know, in our uh, lectionary readings, um, you might remember that originally um, the psalm uh, is thought to have been Psalm 1 and 2, uh, one work, because essentially Psalm 2, and it, it of course, introduces the whole book of Psalms. Psalm two is just the negative to the Psalm one's positive. You know, the Psalm one, and I'll read this. And happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or take the path that sinners tread or sit in the seat of scoffers, but their delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, they meditate day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water, which yield their fruit in its season, and their leaves do not wither. In all that they do, they prosper. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. So any word or phrase that gets your attention? Prosper is in there again. Yep. Also, I would say the word happy um, has a couple of different meanings. Uh, the, the original Hebrew word. Uh, and perhaps a better translation would be blessed. Mm. Okay. So, um, basically, these two Psalms, Psalms 1 and 2, contrast the fate of the godly versus the ungodly. Um, And uh, again, like chaff, uh, yes, it's bad, and it is that is something to that gets thrown away. It's not useful, but also, you know, he emphasizes that <clears throat> the chaff blows away. So again, the impermanence of 
you know, what, you know, the sinner does, you know, that uh, is not, you know, we might say in, in biblical terms, it's not eternal. Or uh, we talked before about uh, the capable wife and that the beauty uh, uh, is not substance. Mm -hmm. you know, that's something that's, that's past. <clears throat> and this psalm is very consistent with the wisdom literature of the Old Testament. So in that way, it fits very well <clears throat> with the, the Old Testament reading from Proverbs. Um, and for them also, wisdom uh, is consistent with following the, the laws and the commandments of God. So essentially, those who follow God are wise. Those who don't, do not. Um, and it connects really well with the epistle text from James that uh, puts the connection between wisdom and righteousness. So let's go on to James. I want you to uh, listen and again, see any words or phrases uh, jump out at you. Who is wise and understanding among you? Show by your good life that your works are done with gentleness born of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition to your hearts, in your hearts, do not be boastful or false to the truth. No, Such wisdom does not come down from above, but it's earthly, unspiritual, devilish. For where there is envy and selfish ambition, there will also be disorder and wickedness of every kind. But the wisdom from above is pure, first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace for those who make peace. Those conflicts and disputes among you, where do they come from? Do they not come from your cravings that are at war within you? You want something and do not have it, so you commit murder. And you covet something and cannot obtain it, so you engage in disputes and conflicts. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly in order to spend what you get on your pleasures. Okay. What jumps out at you here? You do not receive because you ask wrongly. Mm hmm Yeah. You, and I, this is something that I have a long time ago came to realize you have to think about what it is you're asking for and if it's a godly thing that you're asking for hmm. um, and if you really should be directing God about what he needs to do next in your life or whether you should turn it over to him and let him decide what's best for you mm -hmm. and we're doing that sometimes when we pray and we want something we want something and we want it done a certain way Yes. For a certain thing. We want it to happen now and mm -hmm. answer my prayers. Yeah. Uh, I There used to be a sign up in my uh, supervisor's office at work that said something along the lines of, good morning, this is God speaking. I will be in charge of your day. I will not be needing any help from you. Thank you very much. Have a nice day or something like that where you know kind of reflected that we don't always trust god we kind of try to control a little bit mm -hmm. that's what i thought of when i read the part about you're asking the wrong way for the wrong thing in the wrong way mm -hmm. or maybe for the right thing in the wrong way mm -hmm. yeah i think you're on to something there um i, I think hey. If they deal with the right now with the pandemic everybody wants to be spared from the pandemic 
but they mm. didn't want to take the vaccine, which in my opinion, mm -hmm. God gave you a brain <laughs> to use. Yeah. And you're supposed to make the wise choice. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, Again, um, you know, another uh, reference to the, to the news. Um, sometime this week, the president um, spoke to uh, corporation leaders and uh, talking about the mandate of them issuing a mandate uh, uh, for uh, vaccinating workers and explaining the benefits. You know, when people are out sick, you know, they're not working, they're not being productive, and that it's to their advantage to do this. Um, he ended up doing the, the, the mandate himself. I guess the, it, the mandate is for empl employers that employ more than 100 people, they're required. And what he did essentially was these corporate heads knew the advantages of the vaccine, but they didn't want to make their employees fall in line because they didn't want to take the heat. So what the president did, you know, was give them an out. So they could say to their employers, you know, this is requirement now. Um, I figured that out right away, that what he's doing is making, is, is um, letting the employers go, hey, it's the law, wasn't my idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And so in a way that's a courageous thing to do. You know, he's letting, you know, he's taking the heat mm -hmm. uh, and you know, like Truman, you know, the buck stops here, you know, and, and saving uh, these, you know, CEOs from uh, any kind of backlash that they might get. Or lawsuits, you know that some of them, as soon as they try to do it, there'll be a suit against them. Now they can say, I'm just following the law. We're just doing what the law says we have to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so the Aunt James, uh, who or whoever the author is of this book, I'll just call, refer to him as James. Um, he is a Jewish Christian. And so from that background, you know, he would see wisdom as being embodied in God's law. So that, um, and, and this is, you know, God's definition of righteousness, you know, following God's law is, you know, goes back to wisdom. Um, and that only God's righteousness uh, can make people righteousness. And then with, when people are righteous, then they can live harmoniously, you know, in their communities. Um, again, something that's central to James' epistle is that um, uh, there is this dichotomy between true and false wisdom. And true wisdom is from God, from above, and false wisdom is from below, you know, either worldly or earthly. Um, and that, you know, good works are a mark of someone who possesses wisdom. Um, uh, so, you know, you'll, you'll know wisdom by its fruits, which is something that we also get, you know, from Paul. You know, many people think that Paul and James are uh, in opposition to one another, and they really aren't. They dovetail with one another very well. Uh, it's just that Paul concentrated on the faith, and uh, James is concentrating on, you know, the action. But Paul talked a lot about the fruits, you know, which were um, uh, accomplishing things you know, with, by your faith, you know, in your proper response to God, you know, good things happen, good works. Are, it, are, isn't it Paul who says it's by your works that they shall know you as a Christian? Isn't, isn't that a, yeah. I'm not sure what chapter it's in, but um, I think that's where Catholics get their emphasis on good works. Hmm. 
is from it's by your works that they shall know you that mm. you know, people know that they, you're a christian not yes. proselytizing and waving the bible around and stand in front of a church and holding a bible up that isn't going to mm. cut it it's by the way you live and the things you do that they know you're a christian yeah, for decades thing. one of the the um uh songs hymns or whatever uh in the catholic church uh it's almost like their theme song they will know we are christians by our love mm -hmm. of course love is demonstrated in and that absolutely yeah so um this fits in with you know our reading from proverbs that living a godly life is not a matter of escaping from this world uh, you know, just, you know, meditating and praying to God. Um, but it's also to be exercised and made visible in one's daily life. Um, he says that we can, we can make a connection or we can discern what's God's wisdom and what is uh, worldly wisdom is that, you know, worldly wisdom um, leads us on a path, this selfish, you know, lone pioneer path of our own desires. Um, whereas, you know, in God's wisdom, um, it's our, our works are, are directed toward the good, the common good. Um, And last week, of course, we read about uh, one of these obstacles to righteous living was the intemperate speech. You know, uh, and, uh, you know, the tongue is like a fire and all the damage that uh, 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 that speech, hurtful speech or words can cause. So this time he's directing it um, uh, to um, pride and arrogance. Um, and so um, basically he's saying, if you do life with gentleness, with moderation, um, you know, and humility, and uh, actually each of these words is, uh, are, different translations of the same Greek word used here. Um, if, uh, if you do this, you know, um, then you're following God's wisdom. Um, and then he goes on to say what uh, the difference between these sort of fruits, um, you know, uh, God's Wisdom is peaceable. Um, it doesn't dominate, but yields good fruits for everyone. I am in good. Um, um, but so conflicts and disputes in the, in the community show this lack of peace. And he's urging them that they should resolve these, um, which he says are a result of these inner cravings uh, we have. Um, so, um, this, you know, this piece, these fruits, you know, the, the relying on true wisdom is a sign of the spirits, um, present presence in one's life and uh, uh you know james uh uses in the in chapter one he spoke of uh being faithful to the exercise of pure religion uh, and so this is kind of this part of uh, in this third chapter he's he's kind of following up on that same uh theme um and th these qualities that james uh, is encouraging here sound very much like 
Paul's letter uh, to the Galatians, where uh, he identifies fruits of the spirit are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So you see here that James and Paul are very much on the same page. Um, and he's, he's lifting up here that one of the greatest um, uh, attributes or gifts of wisdom is its ability to lead humans to peaceful resolution of, of conflict. Um, so um, wisdom from above is not only peaceable, um, it is, he uses the word gentle, which means not coercive. You know, it's more um, invitational, meaning not um, manipulating or bullying. Um, so that wisdom is uh, having the ability to yield. Um, now, that's one problem that we look at in, in our modern society, at least in this country, is we're definitely seeing uh, a refusal to yield. You know, and this is something that has you know, uh, made uh, our society uh, so divided. Um, uh, there's a, a saying from uh, Walt Whitman, uh, he said, be curious, not judgmental. Um, and, uh, you know, curious, you could say the willingness to learn um, is, comes from, uh, it's part of wisdom, um, but it, it, sh it shows an openness to yield. You know, once you make a judgment, once you label something, you know, and condemn it, um, then, you know, there, there is no possibility of learning, no possibility of yielding uh, to resolve conflict. Um, so, you know, I'm in, in listening <coughs> to some of the public uh, sessions of, of uh, the Senate, um, you just, you see this so strongly that, uh, you know, people who are supposed to be questioning don't really question the person that's coming to testify. You know, instead they uh, begin bullying right from the start. Uh, and what James, I think, is saying here is that uh, when we do this, we are missing out on God's invitation to do something new or to learn something new. Um, James has said before that wisdom um, doesn't have partiality or hypocrisy. That was in our, our first, the first week we were reading uh, in James. Um, Remember how he talked about uh, the church members' partiality for the rich you know, when they entered into the sanctuary. Um, so we're not also uh, looking, and I think uh, we, we've spoken about um, public forums now. The politicians uh, are elected or appointed officials, how difficult it has become to make, uh, to make progress or to make, uh, make decisions because um, of the extreme partiality. You know, whereas you know, even in local school boards, people don't wanna serve because um, you know, people will come to these meetings and then you know, shout and threaten you know, threaten them in their homes, you know, <laughs> their businesses, and they don't, they don't wanna serve because uh, we have, they are getting it from, from all sides and uh, people are not willing to watch the process of discussion 
you know, and learning, you know, different sides to a question. Uh, James says that um, wisdom from above is full of mercy um, and good fruits. Uh, so uh, he's challenging us um, to allow this, these good fruits to uh, grow in ourselves so that then we can um, share them with one another. Um, next question, what does God's wisdom look like in the church? It's too broad a question. I don't understand. Okay, when we make a decision, say for this, like, for example, the session, you know, we come and we make, have discussion and we make uh, decisions. Um, how does God's wisdom play into that? The decisions that we make. Well, we, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, we should be looking at the good of the church and the good of the community that we're in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, we always ask before we begin to say a prayer that we'll be guided by his wisdom and judgment and not by our own interests. I mean, that's usually the theme of the prayer before we start. Um, and we're inspired, hopefully there's some God inspired reason for why the people who are on the session are there in the first place. Hopefully, I like to think of that being the hand of God as to who gets appointed to session, who gets appointed in leadership positions. Hopefully, that's being guided by God using people who have some wisdom and judgment. He speaks through the leadership. And getting back to your comment, uh, Bonnie, about uh, the, the sign that was posted in your workplace, I think it also um, uh, bending to uh, our God's wisdom or open to that. It also reminds us that um, we can't do it all, you know, uh, that uh, things are going to happen, that we can't control, that we can't reconcile, um, and that that's because we're human. Uh, um, and, uh, you know, there are people who, who work themselves to death in their, in their jobs in the church, because it's that idea that um, everything is dependent on me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then we forget that we're ultimately we're just completely dependent upon God. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm gonna go on to uh, the gospel passage. Uh, we're getting close to the hour. Um, here, um, they went on from there and passed through Galilee. He did not want anyone to know it, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, the son of man is to be betrayed into human hands, and they will kill him. And three days after being killed, he will rise again. But they did not understand what he was saying and were afraid to ask him. Then they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, what were you arguing about on the way? But they were silent, for on the way they had argued with one another, who was the greatest? He sat down, called the 12, and said to them, whoever wants to be first must be last of all, and servant of all. Then he took a little child and put it among them. And taking it in his arms, he said to them, whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. Okay. What uh, word or phrase sticks out here for you?
Well, I like the part where he, <laughs> he's, he's kind of straightening them out about who's great. The last mm -hmm. will be first. Mm -hmm. uh, that too many uh, of us might get a little carried away with our ego and think we're really something when we're not. And he was kind of letting them know that, yeah. You, I like to think of the disciples sometimes as being a little more righteous than the rest of us. But then you read a passage like that and think, really? They were <laughs> arguing over who was the, 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 greatest. the best, the greatest, the most beloved, the best. Whatever. Yeah. Uh, um, they fell asleep in the Garden of Gethsemane and they didn't know what he was talking about half the time. And mm. it's another reminder that they were as human as the rest of us. Ab absolutely. Uh, Mark is especially hard on the disciples uh, of the, all the gospel. Uh, they claim not to know him. They ran when the, you know, there's just a lot that makes them not all that disciplined sometimes. Yeah. And this comes, you know, after uh, last week uh, we read about uh, Jesus gave his first warning to them that what was going to happen to him and peter said no no you're wrong you know and and jesus then uh rebuked you know after peter rebuked jesus jesus gave it back to him um and so we realized that and maybe this is a, a little bit of good news for us that uh, even the disciples who were with him when he was alive walked with him every single day they didn't get it <laughs> you know they they took a long road before you know it's it started dawning on them um this in some ways this is very similar to to last week's reading because we have the same pattern that happens you know jesus predicts his betrayal and murder and resurrection the disciples fail to understand um, that he, Jesus corrects them um, and gives them a new definition of discipleship. So we're, we're you know, following very much the same pattern as, as from last week. Um, and of course, what Jesus is telling them about a disciple is, you know, whoever, um, it is wants to, you know whoever wants to be first must be last of all you know he turns the world's assumptions upside down you know because for us it's all about winning being on top you know um and uh you know jesus just stands that on his ear and said nope that's it's exactly the opposite of of what you think um now, uh, I, one thing that, that struck me um, is that um, they didn't understand, okay? And then it says, and were afraid to ask him. That stood out, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, we're we're too often afraid to ask because we kind of know the answer and we don't want to hear it. That's what I was thinking. They were more afraid of the answer than anything. Mm -hmm. Or afraid maybe to reveal that they don't know what he's talking about or that they don't get. You're asking a question because you don't get it. Mm -hmm. And none of them wanted to reveal to him and to the others that there were things they didn't understand. But mm -hmm. mostly afraid of the answer. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm I'm always more impressed uh, with uh, humility in in classrooms. You know, the the kid, the student who raises their hand and said, "I know this may be a dumb question, but and go ahead and ask it." You and it's know. the same thing you were thinking, and were afraid to ask. Mm -hmm. I was wondering the same thing and didn't want to have to yeah. ask. <laughs> yeah, and again, there's there's also some ego involved yeah there. you don't look like the dummy that doesn't get it mm -hmm. even though nobody else in the classroom gets it either <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. been there done that 
Um, so right before this passage, the disciples, you know, have failed to uh, heal the boy who had basically a, a, a clean spirit. Uh, and uh, so that's led them to be kind of puzzled. You know, why can Jesus do this and we can't? Um, and, uh, you know, he goes ahead and, and cures the boy. Um, and uh, so in that story, Jesus tells them, you know, this kind of healing um, can only be accomplished through prayer. It can't be done, you know, by earthly means, meaning, you know, your expertise or your worthiness. You know, it's, uh, it's something that you have to let God work through you. Yeah. And so um, they've now left where they were last week, Caesarea Philippi, and are they're they're entering back into Jewish territory. They're in Galilee now. Um, from what we can gather, the house they're talking about is Peter's house. Um, and uh, he adds. You know, last week he, um, when the first time he warns about his death, um, he didn't say anything about uh, uh, resurrection. Yeah. Well, he didn't say anything about being betrayed, and now he adds that. Uh, what what do you why do you think he might have added that as is the next step in terms of their education? Well, so they, they would be more expecting and understanding of it when it happened. I don't know. They all. Well, some of them, I think, if, if I'm not mistaken, said, well, not me, not me. I'm not going to betray you. And it was cause for self-reflection. Mm -hmm. Is it going to be me? How, you know, I, I think that's part of it. And maybe because as it gets closer to the time, he's revealing a little more and a little more to give them a chance to absorb what's about to happen. And just mm -hmm. dropping the whole thing on them all at once. If they can't get a little piece of it, it really would boggle their minds to be told in advance everything that's going to happen. Yeah. I mean, here they were first upset because they couldn't do a healing miracle like Jesus could. And he takes it a step further. Uh, they, uh, that uh, not only that, but, you know, at this point, you don't get it. And you're actually going to be part of the problem rather than the solution. Mm -hmm. So when they look back, you know, and the res after the resurrection and their eyes are opened, mm -hmm. um, you know, they, this gives them something else to reflect on uh, because you know, it's, it's one thing to go out and tell people about their sins, but it's another thing to realize that you're a sinner too. And that's a part of, you know, our lives of faith and our evangelism. <laughs> that uh, because we can't really uh, tell people, you know, the good news um, if we're doing it from a position of uh, being above and saying, well, you know, I've got it all together. And uh, so if you believe what I believe, then you'll have it all together too. That isn't going to work. You know? um, there has to be that humility that this person you're trying to reach is you, you know, that you, other people have led you along this path to get you to the point where you are. Uh, but, you know, you weren't born, uh, to, uh, you know, a superior, uh, sp spiritually or any other way. Um, 
and uh, the disciples had to have a lot of this humility before they were able to go out and be effective. Yeah. Yeah. Certainly, if they're arguing who among them is the greatest, <laughs> yeah. there's not a lot of humility in that. <laughs> Certainly not. Then we also get um, this incident with the child. Um, and uh, one, the, the, uh, again, I'm thinking about this morning and watching the morning news. Um, you know, we've had this reading about women. Um, and then now one about a child. And I just can't help but thinking about listening to the testimony of those four gymnasts, you know, uh, and being disregarded because they were female and they were young. Um, uh, the word here, uh, the Greek word is uh, uh, pedion, from which we get things like pedagogy and pediatrician and <laughs> so forth. Um, and it's translated as a uh, little, little child, but it has in the Greek a double meaning of, it can either be, you know, your immediate offspring, your child, or it can also mean slave or servant. And children in that society were like, uh, you know, uh, commodities in a sense. They had absolutely no power. Um, and, uh, you know, if anything happened to them, you know, they had no voice. And uh, I kept thinking about that, you know, in light of, uh, you know, we got from Proverbs about, you know, helping the marginalized, you know, we, then we get back here and Jesus is talking about probably the most vulnerable and marginalized people in that society at the time. Um, and uh, you know, um, throughout the Bible, you know, we get uh, this, the idea is just so strong that greatness is determined by how well you treat, you know, the least among you. you know, that's, you know, at the heart of this, uh, the, you, you have to be like a little child. It reminds me of the Matthew 25, you know, he's saying, you know, what you do to the least of these you do to me. And he's saying the same way of, you know, he lifts up this child and embraces it and saying, you know, you give this child standing and respect and dignity because how you treat this child is how you would treat me, you know, um, in a sense. Um, so, um, And I, and look again, looking back into Proverbs, uh, thinking about uh, what uh, a woman's role is, that we, people that uh, uh, make the least money are people who are in caregiver roles to children. I mean, you know, look at you know, daycare workers, uh, <laughs> babysitters, uh, preschool teachers, you know, they don't make enough to live on, you know, and that was set not because of their worth, but because how society deemed their worth. And, you know, not only because it was considered a woman's work, so, you know, they don't deserve as much money as a man, but here they are taking care of children. You know, so we have these mixed messages going on in society, but our values, which are reflected in our budgets and so forth, that uh, we actually uh, pay people uh, the least for jobs that uh, relate to our children or are considered, you know, uh, women's jobs the cleaning and the, you know, all of these, you know, the, the scut work, so to speak. Um, and that was 
that's that's an arbitrary decision based on our priorities in society. Um, you know, we look at today, uh, it's been brought up many times with all the uh, what's going on with the Senate and debating on the bills like the, the child tax credits and, and so forth. Um, looking at, uh, we have one of the highest child poverty rates in the developed world. Yeah. What does this really say about who we're marginalizing in society? And uh, we see that in our economics. So. I've read that one in four children in this country does not know where their next meal is coming from. One in four. Mm -hmm. That's shocking. Yeah. I mean, it, it really is, you know, appalling when we're considered one of the wealthiest nations in the world. Um, and again, that comes back to uh, disparity of wealth, which gets back into James about showing partiality. <laughs> You know, um, that and also uh, James talking in like in today about uh, uh, that self-serving ambition um, rather than the wisdom from above, which uh, looks at uh, God's, you know, caring for all of God's children, um, rather than things just for ourselves. So, um, you know, I think they they all uh, fit together uh, pretty well. Um, I guess we're running out of time, um, but uh, anyway. So the themes for this week are wisdom, the correlations between wisdom and righteousness or uh, godliness um, and uh, that the uh, people judged like in the Proverbs, the king or the young prince uh, was uh, taught to listen to, you know, the intro was listening to your mother and it ends with you know, to take care of the poor and the needy. You know, that's the most important part of your role as a king, you know, in this privileged position. Um, uh, so anyway, I will close. Any, any final parting comments, these scriptures or anything that we, uh, that now looking back, uh, you kind of, put together well proverbs makes a lot more sense now knowing where it comes from that it's kind of an oracle for to prepare someone for the uh, the seat of power and how to use it wisely and not misuse it everything in proverbs makes a lot better sense now um so no, i've never heard that i did not know that yeah i didn't i did not know that and you will find um, similar oracles in other Middle Eastern, like the Egyptian, you know, uh, from the Egyptian culture, ancient uh, Egyptian culture, um, the idea that people who are going to be leaders uh, need to be taught and prepared for their role. And their role is not for themselves, but for their people. George Washington, and I forget what they call it, had a list of rules to live by, like 101 things. And it mm -hmm. had, are you familiar with it? It had come from like a Middle Ages uh, monk or something, and it contained everything from table manners, and it's things like don't wipe your mouth on your sleeve don't pick your teeth with the tablecloth that kind of stuff to an honorable way to treat your enemy in warfare like mm -hmm. if your enemy has lost don't rub it in mm -hmm. uh, and with respect the defeated party all kinds of things and that's kind of what i'm thinking of now remembering what is it what's it called um 
it's not rules to live by, but it's something like that. I've got the book, it's been published. And that was how George Washington mm -hmm. maintained his dignity and his wisdom was by trying to follow all those rules that an honorable man lives by. I'm thinking of that with this book of Proverbs and how that was prepared for a, another leader much, much, much before George Washington. Mm -hmm. yeah, going back to conflict and war, um, that reminded me uh, th this George Washington saying, um, you know, historically, uh, people have looked back on how Germany was treated after World War I and how that uh, nurtured all of the what of all the horrible things that were happening in German society in the 30s, you know, or post World War One, um, and uh, fortunately, we learned our lesson from that on World War Two. And it just sounds crazy, maybe to some people, that we would go into Japan and go into Germany and go to those places and try do food drops and try to build up their economy. I read how the Japanese just loved General MacArthur. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, because he was helping them rebuild and rebuilding their economy and building factories and things. Mm -hmm. And um, to some people that might sound ridiculous, but as a pragmatist myself and a compassionate person, it made perfect sense. We haven't been to war with those countries again since. And it was the right thing to do morally. Mm -hmm. so, yes, you don't beat down your enemy after you've beaten them. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's kind of the challenge that we're, this country is having now with um, Afghanistan, because these people are on the verge of starvation, mm -hmm. and, uh, and they are totally dependent on foreign aid for their people to survive, you know, so, you know, having left there physically, um, you know, our, our leaders are talking about it is why it, it you know it's morally uh, responsible to not let these people starve. Um, John yeah. just lo just looked it up. It's called that's I, so I couldn't remember. It's R George Washington's Rules of Civility and Decent Behavior. Hmm. I've read them all. We it can came. all live by them. It's they're timeless. <laughs> the rules are timeless. These were composed by a French Jesuit in 1595. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, anybody who might be watching this, I urge you to look up or purchase. You can even make, purchase them a little booklet, uh, Rules of Civility and Decent Behavior. We could mm -hmm. all use a few of those a, a from time to time. A good dose of that. <laughs> yeah, sure can. Absolutely. Okay, well, I will uh, conclude us now um, with a, a blessing to go in peace. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for all your time. We'll, we'll see you Sunday. Thank you. Bye. Bye.